If you've ever had an offense ruin a relationship, you want to watch this video. I'm Pastor Mike, and welcome to my new study. It's been a while since I've been able to release a video because we've been busy at Sunrise Fellowship moving from one location to another. Now that we're settling in and getting ready to start the remodel on our new property, I'm ready to start jumping in with some more videos. I hope that I'll be able to release at least one each week. Now, this channel is called Scripture That Makes a Difference because I believe Scripture has made a difference in my life, and I think it can make a difference in everybody else's as well. So all the videos on this channel aim to show how each passage makes a difference today. Now, if this is your first time here, you can learn more about this channel in the description below. And if you find you like hearing how specific passages make a difference in our life today, just click that subscribe button and you'll get more. And stick around to the end because I'm going to show you the four G's of handling an offense. And if you want to, you can read the passage before watching the rest of this video by clicking on the link in the description below. At our church, we're going through a message series that I'm calling The Last Week of the King. It's a Lent series. Lent is that time of year when we prepare ourselves for the sacrifice Jesus is going to make and for his resurrection. We're going to take the next few weeks and take a look at some of the stories that took place in the last week of Jesus' life. And I'm calling this week's message The Authority Inquiry. A uh, subtitle would be A Better Reaction to Offenses. It's based on an inquiry about Jesus' authority and how offensive that really was to Jesus and how he responded to it. We live in a culture where offense comes easily. I found several memes while I was preparing for this talk. And, uh, one of them says, I continue to be offended by the offended. And if you're old enough to remember a, a comedian by the name of Jackie Gleason, you can just hear him saying, Good morning, people of the United States. What shall we be offended by today? But it's really not all that funny, is it? We've raised being offended to the level of a civil right. You have the right to be offended by almost anything anyone else can do, and they should feel the pressure to adjust to your desires. And being offended is just part of the human condition, isn't it? I mean, have you ever had somebody tell you not to be so sensitive and have that actually make you less sensitive? Other things are unknowingly offending to offensive to people. You might talk about a stingy tippers and the way that offends a service staff person or uh, people calling your faith a evidence of your ignorance. Or even simple things like people's vocabulary can sometimes cause offense. Those colorful adjectives that Christians don't feel like should be part of our vocabulary. So how do we deal with an offense? Well, Let's look at how Jesus dealt with an offense. If you took the chance to read the passage ahead of time, you'll see that Jesus is being addressed on his authority. Some of the elders and scribes of his community have come to him with the question, by what authority do you do the things that you do? In truth, this is actually a, an accusation against Jesus. It's a very accusative question that says, we don't think you have the authority. We, we want to challenge your authority, or we want the privilege of approving your authority to teach the things you teach and to do the miracles that you do. Uh, perhaps they were even thinking about Jesus turning over the tables of the money changers, and they may have been challenging, challenging his authority to do such things as that. Jesus silences them with his reply in Matthew chapter 21, verses 24 through 27, as he says to them, I'll answer your question if you'll answer one for me first. John's baptism. Who authorized that? Of course, they don't know how to answer. They're afraid to say that it's from God because then Jesus will say, why didn't you comply? And if they say that that teaching was from man, the crowd around him might just not react well. And so they look at Jesus and say, we don't know. Jesus gives them the same reply. Neither will I tell you then where my authority comes from. And then he gives three parables that counterattack with some more basic issues. 
in chapter 21, verses 28 through 32, he gives the parable of the two sons, one being told to go and work in the field and refuses, but he goes anyway. Another being told to go work in the field, and he agrees, but doesn't. Jesus is using this parable to demonstrate that he prefers late responders to fake responders. Uh, he talks about the hypocrisy of saying, I will, but not doing it, or the potential of repentance that comes with saying, I won't, but later changing your mind and actually doing it. He's basically telling them that hypocrisy just won't cut it. And they're being hypocritical with the question, who gave you the authority? Well, of course it was God the Father. Who else could give the authority to do miracles and to teach with such authority? Jesus recognizes their hypocrisy, and he says, that won't cut it. And he goes on to tell a second parable about tenants, a landowner having built a, a great vineyard, which should have produced an abundant crop, and renting it to some who, by agreement, would give him part of the produce of the, of the vineyard. But when that time came, he sent his servants to collect what was his, and they mistreated the servants, even killed some of them, and would not give him what he deserved. And then Jesus says, the master says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. They'll respect him. But they saw the son coming and decided to kill him, thinking to themselves, the master has no other heir. We'll kill the heir, and then we'll inherit the vineyard, and we'll never have to pay rent again. See, they thought they'd found a loophole. And Jesus is saying that the scribes and the elders couldn't look for loopholes around the authority that Jesus had. Jesus' authority was real, and they had no authority to challenge it. And so Jesus tells a third parable now. This is in the next chapter, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, again responding to the challenge of his authority, telling a parable about a king giving a wedding feast. And he invited all the nobles who had property, and none of them wanted to come. So he sends his servants out to the highways and the byways, bring in the common people, and fill the wedding hall. Some pastors would stop at that point and say, see what it says right here in the Bible that you're supposed to go out and attract people to the church. But in the text, Jesus continues to talk. And he says, when the king came to look at the guests, to, to meet the guests, to have a conversation with them, he found one that didn't have on wedding clothes. The implication was that since they were from the highways and byways and from the common people, they didn't have the expected wedding garments. And the king had made a gift of these wedding garments and someone had refused the gift. I can just picture that. Somebody coming in line to get into this great banquet and his work clothes all greasy or grimy and being offered a brand new suit of clothes. And this person looking at the servant and saying, well, who do you think you are? This is me. This is the way I dress. This is the way I always am. You should accept me like this and barging into the party. The king, of course, would not accept that. The gift had been given freely. It should have been accepted. And so he has the man cast out. And then Jesus finishes his parable by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. In essence, he's saying all were invited, but few enough were committed. You see, there are conditions, and many weren't willing to meet the conditions. In the parable, it was to wear the provided wedding clothes. In, in Christianity, it's faith. Everything in discipleship is by faith. But faith has an effect, and our faith needs to lead us to the place where we're obedient to what we're taught. In essence, he's saying to the people, it takes more than presumption. You can't assume the right to challenge Jesus' authority. You're being called to bow to it. And through all this, we can see Jesus focusing on bigger issues. When he was offended, he focused on key things like the hypocrisy and the manipulation and the presumption that was evident in the question. He wasn't distracted by people's personalities or the hurt that they'd caused. And that's what we can learn from this passage as well. We need to lock into the real issues, not the personality or the hurt. And this is never easy. Sometimes we need help not to focus on the hurt or the personality issues involved in these offenses. I've gotten a great deal of help from 
Peacemaking Ministries International, uh, and they give us four key tenets to help us prepare so that when we're offended, we can react properly. Uh, the first is to glorify God. The scripture says to us that whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, we're supposed to do everything for God's glory. And we need to set that as the first tenet of dealing with offenses. How is God reacting? Is God's reputation enhanced? Are we doing things that he would smile about? And after we've got that attitude down inside of us, we can begin to look at the second tenet, getting the log out of our own eye. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus told us not to offer to help other people with their issues until we've dealt with our own issues. And he used that comical illustration of a man with a great big log sticking out of his eye, offering to take a speck of dust out of his friend's eye. Can you just imagine him swinging around and seeing that speck in his eye and walking up to helping him and knocking him with that log and knocking him over and basically making things worse? We have to do that too, because when we're not willing to recognize that we have contributed to an offense, maybe beforehand by something we didn't even know we've done, or, or after the fact by the way that we react to the offense, then we're only going to make it worse by trying to confront that offense. And that's actually the third tenet, is to gently confront. When we go to talk to someone, we need to be gentle about it. We need to be kind. We need to not be accusative or inflammatory with our words, but genuinely have the other person's best interests in mind as we confront the offense that we've suffered. And after we've glorified God and sought to get the log out of our own eye and gently confronted the other person, then we can go from that point and try to rebuild the relationship, go and be reconciled with that person, if that's at all possible. And I can just hear some of you saying, but Pastor Mike, that's just too hard. How do I do that? How, how is it possible for a simple human being to, to be so magnanimous? I would suggest that you seek first to exercise the fruit of the Spirit. Things like peace and patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control are the result of the Holy Spirit being in our life. We can also trust the Holy Spirit to meet whatever need might come up, the right word or the right attitude or the right timing. Sometimes it just takes his leadership to do that. And when we have a hard time recognizing which issues we do need to address and which issues we need to just let go, prayer is always a core in almost anything a Christian does and can be helpful here as well. I remember a time when I had offended someone in my church and I knew that I had done something wrong and was very worried about confronting them and telling them that I was in the wrong. I prayed about it for several weeks and suddenly I found myself in a public place with this person and the conversation just naturally steered to the issue. The Spirit gave me the right words and the right attitudes and the other person and I both exercised the fruit of the Spirit and we reconciled our relationship and are still friends to this day. So I know this can be done, but I also recognize that it's very difficult. I also recognize that it can be very rewarding. If we follow the four G's, we might prevent or avoid an argument. We might win respect from the person we're con confronting or being confronted by, or we might win respect from an audience that is watching. We might avoid the consequences of an uncomfortable confrontation. These things can only happen if we remember that if we need to confront an offense, we better do it right. So, have you had to respond to an offense at some point in your life? Did you use any of these principles? How did it work out for you? I'd love it if you put some of that down in the comments below and we can have a conversation back and forth about that. And please leave other comments and questions too. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'll respond to whatever you put in the comments just as soon as possible. And if you have suggestions for future topics, you can put those down there too. And if you gained any value by watching this video, please click that thumbs up button 
And if you want to hear more specific passages and how they can make a difference in today's world, click the subscribe button and click the bell so that you're the first to know when I release new episodes. Don't forget that you can help get the difference-making message of the scripture to others by sharing this video on your favorite social media. If you live anywhere near Enid, Oklahoma, please come by and visit us. Our address is on our Facebook page. I've left a link to that below. Our services take place at 10 a.m., and I hope we'll get a chance to meet soon. And keep watching. I release a new video every few days. And until next time, remember this. No one had more right to be offended than Jesus. And we do well to follow his example.